Welcome back to This Week in Immigration. I'm Jordan Lapierre. On the program this week, reports of a new caravan attempting to leave Guatemala for the U.S., the White House plans to transfer Pentagon funds for a border wall, and how the Trump administration is shaping employment-based immigration. All that's just ahead, plus the gavel. Before we get started, please remember you can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you leave a review, it'll help more people find our show. You can also stream This Week in Immigration on our website at bipartisanpolicy.org slash podcasts. And as always, check out bipartisanpolicy.org slash immigration for more information on the stories we discuss here on the show. Here with me today are Teresa Cardinal-Brown, Director of Immigration and Cross-Border Policy. She's on Twitter at BPC underscore T Brown. Hi, Teresa. Hi, how you doing? Good. And Chris Ramon, Senior Immigration Policy Analyst on Twitter at C Ramon BPC. Hi, Chris. Hey, Jordan. How's it going? Great. Thanks. All right. Let's start here. Earlier this month, a group of migrants in Guatemala decided to travel north to seek asylum at the U.S.-Mexico border, marking the latest so-called migrant caravan from Central America. Officials estimated the size of the caravan at around three to 4,000 people. Mexico closed some border crossings to deter the group, and it isn't clear whether it remains intact. But the group's sudden emergence resurfaces questions about whether new enforcement measures by the U.S. and Mexico have successfully stifled caravans as a travel option. So who is in this caravan, who organized it, and what was the response from U.S. and Mexican officials? So the basic overview is that, yeah, we've uh, this caravan rushed from Guatemala. Um, you know, it contained, I know, some nationals from Honduras and El Salvador who traveled to the country then to be able to travel up to uh, the Mexican border with Guatemala and then obviously travel to the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, you know, one of the things that's always emphasized with this is that, you know, whether there are any civil society actors that are active in organizing this, at least from the reports that I saw, I didn't see like an active presence. But I think what's important is the reaction. Um, as, you know, this caravan left and arrived in Mexico, one of the core questions that a lot of people were asking is how uh, Mexican President Manuel, uh, Manuel Lopez Obrador, or AMLO, as you know, a lot of Mexicans like to refer to him as, uh, would react. And there was a very strong clamp down at the Guatemalan Mexican border. Um, you know, there was, uh, you know, sometimes this process of how an immigrant um, can show up to the border and present themselves for asylum uh, protections at the border, that didn't really happen here. Just people were detained and people were beginning to be deported. Um, so that really was sort of the Mexican response. The U.S. response, I believe DHS did say that obviously the Guatemalan uh, asylum cooperation agreement that the United States has uh, with, with that country to send back uh, people who seek asylum at the U.S.-Mexico border, that these individuals would be subject to that um, to that agreement if they aren't Guatemalan nationals. Uh, you know, Salvadoran or Honduran immigrants would be sent there. Um, and that was sort of what the U.S. positioning is. But I think that the question moving forward is, of course, if anybody gets through as part of the caravan, if, uh, you know, that what, what will happen on the way to the United States. Because what we've seen in these caravans is, Eventually, they just start dwindling in numbers just through sheer attrition. So I think that's more or less what this case is. We spent a good deal of 2018 talking about migrant caravans. And since then, the U.S. and Mexico have adopted new policies to deter the arrival of migrants traveling this way. Walk us through those changes in both countries and how they affect affect caravans in particular? Sure. So since the rise of the caravans uh, in 2018, uh, the Trump administration has done several policies uh, adjusting eligibility for asylum that directly um, impact those who might come to the border, no matter how they come, whether uh, on their own or via caravans. The biggest changes in policy are the migrant protection protocols, which says that if you manage to come into the United States, you would be required to wait in Mexico while your hearing is undertaken. And we know that somewhere between 55 and 60,000 individuals um, have been put in that process and are waiting in Mexico or uh, return to Mexico to await their hearings in the United States. So the idea that coming in a caravan or any other method is going to enable you to come and be released in the United States is no longer really the case. 
add to that restrictions on who is eligible to apply for asylum. So first you had um, asylum regulations that the administration issued. Um, the most significant one and the one that has not been enjoined um, says that if you have traveled through another country other than Mexico to get to the United States, uh, you are ineligible to apply for asylum or you're ineligible for asylum. So that means even if they come, even if they make the claim, uh, that that regulation would deny them asylum in the United States. They would not they would not qualify. And lastly, it is the asylum cooperation agreements, uh, the so-called safe third, although we don't call them that, agreements with Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, particularly the Guatemalan agreement, which is the only one operational right now, um, that says that the United States will and has um, repatriated people, sent people who come to the United States at the border um, back instead of to Honduras or their country of nationality to Guatemala. Um, and Guatemala then it would be the place where they could apply for asylum if they chose to do so. Um, so those policies uh, taken comprehensively effectively deny access to the U.S. asylum system for people who arrive at the U.S.-Mexico border. Now, in addition to those asylum policies, the United States, through its agreements with Mexico, as Chris said, and with Guatemala and other countries in the region, um, have beefed up the ability of those countries to also uh, secure their border um, and have uh, asked those countries, and particularly in Mexico, say, to to impede and deny these caravans access to the U.S.-Mexico border. So for this caravan uh, from Honduras to Guatemala, Guatemala is now, with United States government help, enforcing its border with Honduras so that Hondurans can't easily, as easily cross into Guatemala, particularly now that this caravan is made known those resources were at the Guatemala-Honduras border, and they managed to stop, reports differ anywhere from a several hundred to a thousand of these migrants from even crossing, from even crossing through into Mexico. Um, and, our, and Guatemala is now in the process of repatriating many of those back to Honduras. As Chris said, Mexico also um, is securing its southern border with Guatemala. So for those that make it through to Gu Guatemala to Mexico, they're either being stopped at the Mexican border. Um, Mexico is entertaining asylum applications from some of them or other, quote unquote, humanitarian visas for those that are willing to stay and work in southern Mexico, basically. Um we don't really have good data or information on how many of the uh, caravan participants may be taking advantage of those of those uh, options. But we also know that Mexico is also in the process of getting ready to repatriate Hondurans back to Honduras and others in the caravan. So I think the main thing to understand is that there are, the United States has put in place since the original caravans a much more extensive system that to, to stop caravans from actually getting to the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and that the, the experience of this caravan is significantly different than the caravans that preceded it. Does the emergence of this caravan, though, challenge any assumptions about the way this enforcement-first approach has impacted migrant travel patterns? I think one of the things to understand about this phenomenon is that we don't always talk about, and I think it's maybe underreported, is the influence of the smuggling organizations in determining the means, methods, and modes by which migrants come to the United States. So the existence of the caravans originally was an attempt to for migrants to take control of their own migration out from the smugglers, um, to do so in numbers so that they would not be uh, you know, subject to uh, some of the the extortion that smugglers may have or, um, you know, some of the assaults and other things that have been reported um, and safety in numbers. But there was also the sense that being coming to the United States in those numbers would force the United States to let them in. Well, that didn't happen. After those caravans, people did return to the smuggling organizations and the smugglers said, look, you don't have to do this for a comfortable fee. We will take you on a comfortable air conditioned coach bus all the way to the U S border where we will escort you across. And then you can find the closest nice border patrol agent and turn yourself in. Well, the asylum rules changes now make that not accessible. And the smuggling organizations then started moving toward other mechanisms and kind of back to what it used to be, which they have to do clandestine crossing, which is more dangerous and, and more concerning. So the caravans are coming back. And 
I think that's that what we have to understand is that migration is one of those phenomena where it is um, a little bit of a cat and mouse between the, the, the facilitators, the smugglers, and they have a business um, uh, motive uh, for finding ways in and around uh, to get people through to the United States and the actions and reactions of the governments along the way. Um, and that's always been the case, and that's continuing to be the case here. I think to build off of that, the I think that the principal point, um, to use a quote from one Jeff Goldblum, which is nature always finds a way, which is to say that people will always find a way to migrate um, or attempt to migrate uh, to a destination uh, with the means that are available to them um, and the resources that are available to them, and that can adjust and flow. Um, you know, a method that we might have assumed had gone out of use can suddenly find um, new utility in a new context. And I think that that's the thing to think about right now is um, how migrants view the caravans as a potential alternative. But as Teresa said, it is also very much a question of how um, the factors that enable migration, such as smugglers and the cartels, utilize information to sort of alter these things. So migration is a dynamic process. It, it is an organism in a way. It sort of adjusts. It finds new ways or finds old ways. And I think that that's really what we're seeing here is I think the assumption that any given policy regime will suddenly see a form of migration just disappear from the history books, I think is presumptuous. It, you know, things can always return. Um, everything old is new sometimes. Okay, when we come back, funding the border wall. The Washington Post reported recently that the Trump administration plans to transfer $7.2 billion in Pentagon funds for the border wall. Those funds would reportedly come from military construction and counter-narcotics budgets and could fund as much as 885 miles of new border fence. To better understand, let's welcome in Dave LePan, BPC's Vice President of Communications. Dave is a retired Marine colonel and former Pentagon and DHS spokesperson with deep knowledge of the issues at play here. So, Dave, can you walk us through what the White House is considering doing with these funds and how this move differs from the one that the White House pursued in 2019? Sure. Uh, and this does get a little complicated, so I'll try to break it down as simply as possible. Uh, as you mentioned, the uh, reports are that $7.2 billion of DOD funds will be reprogrammed and moved over to Homeland Security to fund uh, the border wall. That breakdown, I think, as you noted, was $3.5 billion of that for out-of-the-counter drug funding and $3.7 billion out of the military construction budget. Now, comparing that to 2019, the total was $6.1 billion. So uh, this year, again, $1.1 billion more overall. And the breakdown that year was $2.5 billion from the counter drug funds and $3.6 billion from military construction. So the big difference there being $1 billion more this year coming out of counter drug funds. So how does this transfer of funds impact the armed forces? In other words, what's not getting done as a result of, this, of the decision to shift this money? Well, like a lot of things with the Pentagon, it's a matter of them having to reprioritize. So they were counting, the Pentagon was counting, uh, for example, last year, in that $3.6 billion of military construction funds going to fund nearly 200 separate projects, both here in the United States and overseas. Things like schools, medical facilities, training facilities, child care facilities— those were things that the Department of Defense determined either needed to be built, repaired, upgraded, things of that nature. And there's usually a long timeline. They're identified years ahead of when the need is 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 present. They go through the appropriations process with Congress to try to get the funds for those. Once the funds are appropriated, then they go into construction. So that meant last year that $3.6 billion in military construction funds that were taken away for the border wall meant DOD had to forego all of those construction projects. So this is two years in a row now that the same two accounts have essentially been drawn down from in order to fund a different project. How much do the effects of that compound year over year? Well, 
So an example is those nearly 200 projects from 2019 that were not funded because the money was taken again for the border wall. What does DOD do this year? They probably had an entire different list of projects that they intended to be funded in 2020. So now the projects that fell off the board, so to speak, in 2019, will they ever become funded? Are they being put back on the list? It's unlikely they were put on the list for this year because they had new requirements. So DOD, again, is going to have to decide, one, what to do with the 2019 projects that weren't funded. Now they're going to have to figure out which projects in 2020 will not receive funding and then how they address that in the future. Because one of the the features was at the time that last year's funding reprogramming happened, DOD was counting on Congress to do what they were calling backfilling. The idea that in this year's appropriation, Congress would recognize that they didn't get the $3.6 billion that they had asked for last year, and Congress would add that in, except Congress didn't. So rather than those projects just simply being delayed, which is what DOD's hope was, those projects now have to be reconsidered as to whether they're needed and when to put them back in the queue. Well, and you bring up the budget process, and presumably the Pentagon had to submit this list of projects that they wanted funding for early on in that budget process, but then this decision to reprogram money was made at the end of the budget process, so they couldn't make that list of projects uh, at the beginning with full knowledge of what money they were going to have to work with. What kind of impact or challenge does that present? So that's a great point because, uh, again, at the time that this happened last fiscal year, DOD knew that it was going to lose this amount of funding. Um, And they had to, uh, as I said, they were counting on Congress backfilling. When they submitted their list for 2020 projects, that was done almost a year ago, you know, in last February when the president's budget is first submitted. Congress didn't make the decision on the 2020 budget, the full appropriations, after going through some continuing resolutions until the nearly the end of December. So it is highly unlikely that DOD would have foreseen what they needed to do in 2020 based on what had happened in 2019. So the broader question then is, how does the White House have authority to make these shifts? Doesn't Congress control the power of the purse? That's a great question. And, and Congress, uh, you know, that's the shorthand that's been talked about. One of the powers under the Constitution that the, the Congress holds is, the, uh, again, what's known as the power of the purse. They're the ones who appropriate funds. That's why I said, too, the president's budget request is submitted, you know, in February generally. It's a request. Congress is the one that actually decides what the full funding will be and appropriates the funds. So what happened last year in the spring, the president declared a national emergency over the border, the southwest border. And under that national emergency, they were able to tap into some authorities that allowed reprogramming of Defense Department funds to fund the border wall. Uh, There were two different parts of, of the law, both Title 10 and Title 33, that were involved Uh, One of those allowed them, again, to dip into the counter-drug funds uh, for this purpose, and the other one was allowed them to dip into the military construction funds. So the question now is, at the end of this year, we've seen six to eight months of declining numbers of border crossers. Is the national emergency still valid? Are we still in a national emergency? In order for the president to use the funds as he's asked for, and he wants to reprogram DOD money, it can only be done under a national emergency. So interesting question there. The conditions don't seem to indicate an emergency, but the desire to work around Congress, which is absolutely what this is. Uh, One interesting point, the president's budget for 2020 asked for $5 billion dollars for border wall construction, part of the DHS budget. Congress, at the end of the year, when they finalized the budget appropriations, gave the president basically $1.4 billion. So Congress, with the power of the purse, decided that the president didn't need $5 billion and appropriated $1.4. The president has now used this authority to 
try to get an additional $7.1 billion over and above the $1.4 that Congress appropriated. So both of those together are much bigger than the actual budget requests that the president submitted for $5 billion last year. All right, Dave LaPan, thanks for being here. After the break, a look at employment-based immigration. Since President Trump signed the Buy American, Hire American executive order in April 2017, we've been following the administration's efforts to tighten legal avenues for highly skilled foreign-born workers to be employed in the United States. New U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services data shows many of the administration's policies directly target the H-1B specialty occupation visa, which is actually the most common visa category employers use to hire high-skilled foreign workers. Rachel Yakino, Immigration Project Associate, is here to talk about that executive order and its impact on employment-based immigration. Rachel, welcome to the show. Thank you. Excited to be here. Rachel, can you give us some background on the Buy American, Hire American order and how it has impacted employers seeking to hire foreign workers? Yeah, absolutely. So the Buy American and Hire American executive order was signed back in April 2017, and its primary objective is pretty straightforward. It's to create higher wages and employment rates for native U.S. workers, and it directs DHS to advance policies that ensure H-1B visas are only awarded to the most high-skilled or highest-paid foreign-born workers. And what's particularly interesting is that it explicitly directs the secretaries of Homeland Security, Labor, State, and the Attorney General to issue new rules and guidance that governs their agencies in order to protect the interests of Native U.S. workers. So you see that play out when you review the data and how it's changed over time since the executive order was implemented back in 2017 to today. Walk us through what you found in this new USCIS data. Do they indicate the impacts of the executive order thus far? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if we take back a look back to 2015 under the Obama administration, out of all of the H-1B petitions that were submitted during that fiscal year, only 22.3% of them received an RFE. And our RFE is a request for evidence. It's a mechanism you at USCIS adjudicating officers have to ask an employer to provide additional evidence for a, a myriad of reasons. Um, it could be to clarify someone's wage, um, where they're working. And of those petitions that received an RFE in 2015, 83.2% of them were sub subsequently approved. So that, that was a pretty high rate in the fiscal year 2015. But if we look at 2019, USCIS reported an RFE rate for H-1B visas of 40.2%, which is almost double from what it was in fiscal year 2015. And of those petitions that received an RFE in 2019, only 65.4 of them were subsequent, subsequently approved. So to sum it all up, 2015 saw an overall H-1B approval rate of 95.7%, so pretty high. And by the time fiscal year 2019 rolled around, that's dropped to 84.8%. So talk a little bit more about these requests for evidence. Um, how do they work and why is USCIS issuing more of them? Absolutely. So when an employer submits an H-1B petition, um, an adjudicating officer at USCIS essentially has three options. They can they get the case, they can review it, they can either outright deny it, outright approve it, or go back to the employer with an, a request for evidence. Um, and typically, this is a formal avenue used to clarify any ambiguities in a case. Like I said before, that could be wage issues where someone is working. Um, it's essentially a way to gather more information for the USCIS officer to use to determine, yes, I'm going to approve this H-1B visa, or no, I'm going to deny it. So then what does all this information mean for the H-1B program writ large? So um, a couple of things to understand. I mean, this is one of a series of um, changes that USCIS has made to policies on how they adjudicate applications and petitions. Rachel said that saw the data, but the actual policies that result that had these results were a couple. One was a change in the policy that said that adjudicators uh, who are looking at a renewal petition for somebody who's already been here and working here um, cannot take into account the prior 
approval uh, in considering the renewal. In other words, they're not giving that prior approval deference. What that essentially means is that every renewal is a brand new case. You have a new adjudicator looking at it. They're not necessarily given deference to the fact that a previous adjudicator approved that case. And so they are asking for evidence that they think they need to extend that case. Um, so that's one of the policy changes that is probably leading to the increased uh, requests for evidence. The other thing was a policy change that said that, Rachel said there are three avenues. There used to be four things an adjudicator could do with a case. Uh, they could approve it right away. They could issue a request for evidence. Um, or they could issue something called a notice of intent to deny, which is a little bit stronger form than the RFE. It's like, look, I don't quite think you qualify, but if you think you do, I'm giving you one last chance to give me some more information to show that you qualify for this visa. Um, now, that data shows that they that the policy change said that adjudicators no longer need to issue that document. Um, they can go straight to a denial, particularly in cases where the initial application just fails to include a piece of information that is necessary for the application or petition. So there are more straight up denials than there used to be um, in addition to the RFEs that are coming up. All of these things essentially mean that for employers and employees who are scrambling to get one of the limited number of H-1B visas, um, even if their petition is accepted into the pool of adjudications, the process to get to adjudication is taking longer and the chances that they will be denied are, are up. Be denied are, are up. Yeah, and I think more broadly, I think this is kind of a full manifestation of how Buy American, Hire American and these policies have really impacted the, uh, the employment-based system as a whole whole um the analogy is sort of like you're you're in a light uh lighthouse and you're seeing in the fog something approaching you don't know if it's a boat and then you start realizing that it is a ship and i use this analogy because i think after the executive order was signed you started hearing immigration attorneys start to note that there's a lot more rfe requests and this eventually led to um, a Reuters piece by this great journalist, uh, Yegane Turbati. She's now at ProPublica. But she was one that kind of broke open the RFE story by um, getting data uh, and looking at RFE request rates and noticed that they started increasing significantly. Um, and that kind of put this a little bit on the radar. And I remember I went to a USCIS um, ombudsman conference that December. This story broke, I think, in September 2017. Um, and I went to this conference in December 2017, and uh, immigration attorneys were asking the administration, like, well, what's the policy? What are you guys doing? Why is there more RFEs? Um, and so, you know, taking what was happening then and seeing what's happening now through Rachel's analysis of the data and Teresa's looking at these policies kind of shows that gradually we're seeing that this is definitely clamping down on legal immigration. Um, it was very difficult to kind of see this at the beginning, which is why I used that, um, you know, the, the, the ship in the fog analogy in 2017. But now I think it's very much clear, uh, you know, how these policies and how the data reflects, I think, the, the way that these policies have impacted the legal immigration system. Finally today, it's the gavel where we take a rapid fire look at immigration policy in the courts. For each case, we'll discuss what the relevant judge ruled and why it matters. First, a federal court in New York upheld an injunction against the Trump administration's public charge regulations that sought to limit green cards to people who could demonstrate they wouldn't use public benefits. This ruling came after two other courts overturned nationwide injunctions against the regulations. So what did the court say and why does it matter? So it was a very short ruling by a three-judge panel of the Second Circuit in New York basically declining to stay the lower court's injunction. Um, so that injunction remains in place. Um, the injunction is still being appealed. So the Second Circuit, of course, is waiting on briefs from the administration and the plaintiffs in the case uh, on that appeal. But for now, the injunction is, is still in place. Uh, this is basically, you know, what does this mean? Uh, it's last man standing. Essentially, this is the last injunction in place against the public charge rule. Um, I think the administration is making plans to appeal this directly to the Supreme Court, um, and that will like, likely determine the extent to which um, the rule comes into play and you know, alters our immigration system. So we'll see what happens. Second, another federal judge recently enjoined an executive order requiring refugee resettlement organizations to receive approval from state and county governments to apply for funding to assist with that resettlement process. Some argue the policy would essentially prohibit resettling refugees if either a state or a county declined to sign off. 
So what did the judge say and why does it matter? Sure. So in this this case, um, the judge uh, ruled that the um, executive order, it was not a regulation, it was an executive order that required this consent from states and localities, was essentially uh, beyond what Congress intended for the refugee resettlement process. He went very closely through the statutory language and said that the statute is pretty clear that the refugee resettlement uh, agencies and the government are required to consult with state and local governments on a very regular basis, that they are required to take into consideration their recommendations, but that there is no uh, ground in the statute that allows the government to give the states and localities essentially a veto over resettling refugees in the United States. So uh, the injunction was issued, interestingly, it was issued one day after Governor Abbott of Texas became the first governor to say they would not accept refugees. Uh, Prior to that, 42 other state governors had said they would. Um, So uh, as of right now, uh, this requirement is no longer in play, so it's unclear what Governor Abbott's uh, letter means. If anything, um, we have to see what happens. Um, you know, th- this is pretty significant because, uh, you know, this executive order has been receiving a lot of attention for the reasons that Teresa noted that um, a lot of governors, including uh, red state governors, have been actually signing on uh, with the notable exception of Governor Abbott. Um, you know, the, the concern is, as you noted in the introduction to this, is that, you know, if a, a state governor and a county don't agree, essentially refugees can't be settled there. Um, and this could potentially really limit the, the 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 areas where they can be resettled and can impact the the, prob, the, the program at large. Um, so you know, once again, it really remains to be seen what's going to happen with that. But given that we did see more red state governors, at least the governors, at least not the counties yet, but seeing more uh, red state governors kind of signing on and saying we want refugees to be resettled here, though, um, it might be the case that the implementation may not be going in the direction the administration wanted it to. Okay, Chris, Teresa, that's a good place to leave it. Thanks for joining me. We'll be back in two weeks, but in the meantime, please take a second to find us on Facebook by searching Bipartisan Policy Center or on Twitter at BPC underscore bipartisan. And don't forget to subscribe and leave your feedback on this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Just search Bipartisan Policy Center. I'm Jordan Lapierre. This Week in Immigration was created by Teresa Cardinal-Brown and myself. The executive producer of This Week in Immigration is Teresa Cardinal-Brown. This week's episode was written by Chris Ramon and myself and produced by Chris Ramon, Yafat Tawahada, and me. Our editor is Yafat Tawahada, and the executive producer of BBC Podcasts is Ashley Swearingen. That's all for now. Join us again next time on This Week in Immigration. 